Um, hello, everybody. I hope you can um, hear me and that um, everything is, is functioning well. Um, wanted to welcome you. My name is Stephen Doughty. I'm a member of the United Kingdom Parliament. Um, I represent a constituency in South Wales. I'm a Labour Member of Parliament, but I chair the all party group on HIV and AIDS in the UK Parliament. And um, uh, as we've been hosting the uh, G7 uh, in the last week, and uh, a crucial time when we've just had the uh, UN high level meeting on HIV and AIDS General Assembly high level meeting, um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all today and an absolutely distinguished panel um, to discuss uh, the outcome of these meetings, um, where we are in the global fight and uh, what challenges remain. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be partnering today with uh, UNAIDS, uh, with the United Nations Global Fund, um, Unite Network, uh, Stop AIDS, and many other organisations, and also to welcome uh, panellists from around the world, including uh, political colleagues from other parliaments who do such a crucial role in uh, fighting for um, uh, action on HIV and AIDS, both in, in our own countries, but also globally. Um, so I'm just going to briefly introduce who we've got today with us, and then we're going to move on to um, some presentations and then uh, some panel discussions and a chance for uh, question and answer uh, in due course. Um, so we're delighted today to have uh, Rosemary Musimunale uh, from UNAIDS um, uh, standing in for Winnie, um, who uh, has been unwell, I think she's uh, uh, been uh, so busy with different uh, negotiations and meetings and, 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 and so on over the past week, but we're delighted Rosemary's with us to speak on behalf of UNAIDS. Uh, we have Peter Sands, um, who you'll be well know is the director of the UN Global Fund um, and uh, a well-known figure to many of us and delighted to have him with us here today. Um, we also have Ricardo Baptista uh, Lieta, who is the uh, head of the UNITE um, network of global parliamentarians to end infectious diseases, which obviously works on HIV and AIDS, but also on other diseases. Um, it's a network I'm very proud to be part of and really delighted to have Ricardo with us. We have Mike Podmore uh, from Stop AIDS, uh, activist and campaigning organisation who we work very closely with. Uh, we have Andrew Ullmann, who is a, a member of the German Bundestag, uh, joining us as an FDP member and um, a, a long-time activist and campaigner on these issues. Um, so delighted to have you with us as well, Andrew, and Germany, of course, taking over the uh, uh, presidency of the G7 next. So we thought that was particularly appropriate. We have Pumiza Tisele uh, from Cape Town, um, a, an activist from South Africa, um, who's done a lot of work around TB and HIV as well. And we have Aaron Sunday, um, uh, who is living with HIV himself, but also executive director of the African Network of Adolescents and one of the youth representatives, I believe, on the Global Fund uh, board. So um, it's a real pleasure to have all of our panellists. I hope I haven't missed any of them. Uh, apologies if I have. We will come in due course to you. Um, but I really wanted to welcome everybody today who is joining us on the webinar. I think we have a good few hundred uh, people joining from across the world. So that is uh, really, really fantastic. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to some um, opening uh, remarks from a few of our panellists and then we'll open up to questions. So um, first I wanted to welcome uh, Rosemary from UNAIDS uh, to make remarks and uh, then we'll come on to Peter and Ricardo. Win um, uh, Rosemary, over to you. Thank you very much, Honourable. Um, first of all, let me uh, check. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. All good. good. Cheers, good. Rosemary. Yeah, but I just wanted to start by uh, again uh, uh, giving you the, the apologies of uh, uh, our executive director, Madame Winnie Bianima. Uh, as you already heard, she's not been well, uh, but also to give you her gratitude and thanks. I mean, without naming anybody, everybody on this panel has had a hand, has had some influence, has had some inputs in the recently uh, concluded uh, high level meeting. It wasn't only that, but there was also advocacy around many issues, around funding issues. I mean, we are grateful to the work that has been done by Stop AIDS. We are very grateful also by the work that has been done by UNITE. They were in different panels. Uh, the director general of the, of the, of the, uh, of the the executive director of the Global Fund uh, was in several sessions. So we really are very grateful for the, uh, the, the general and huge effort that was uh, in the last HLM. I also want to really congratulate uh, the all party parliamentary group and, uh, and on, on HIV and AIDS. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that at one time I was ambassador in London and I know the importance of the all party parliamentary group 
in bringing everybody across the aisle to really focus on this without uh, really uh, any undue differences. So we, we really are very grateful for this opportunity. We think that uh, the fact that Germany is going to be the next G7 a, a host is very, very strategic and important. And we hope that the issues discussed here can be really carried forward for the many reasons that I'm sure we'll be discussing today. Uh, I also wish to, uh, to, uh, to uh, share as requested uh, regarding the last, uh, the recent uh, HLM. Uh, as you know, after weeks of robust discussions and negotiations, the United Nations uh, member states adopted an ambitious but achievable new political declaration entitled Ending Inequalities and Getting on Track to End AIDS by 2030. This declaration is based on concrete evidence, as you will have seen, and is grounded in human rights and will serve as an important roadmap to prioritize work on advancing the global HIV response over the next five years. The 2021 political declaration milestones to be achieved include new targets. And these are targets that have been discussed and agreed by many countries, by several uh, actors, by the civil society, by all those that were engaged in the discussions. And these are to ensure that 95% of the people at risk of HIV use combination HIV prevention services and there is greater emphasis on community-led provision of services, including a target to ensure that 80% of services for key populations and other affected groups are provided by them, themselves and within their communities. And there was also commitment to end inequalities going far beyond the sustainable development goal number 10 of reducing inequalities. So we felt that this was really a strong milestone that was able to be achieved. What we'd really like to say here is that we'd like to call on you and through you all the partners and allies to support the implementation of this bold declaration that we hope will guide and we believe will guide the global efforts to end the pandemic that has ravaged our countries and communities for 40 years. This high level meeting discussed at, the, at length the next focus areas, which include, but are not limited to, addressing inequalities to end AIDS, 10 years as we head towards 2030, putting people and communities at the center of the response to HIV AIDS, galvanizing resources and funding for an effective AIDS response. And here we really want to uh, to, to, to say thank you for all the MPs, for all the organizations like Stop AIDS that has really been pushing for this. Advancing gender equality and empowering uh, women and girls in the AIDS response, and I'll come back to this. And addressing the impact of COVID-19 on the AIDS response and building back better for the pandemic preparedness. So these are some of the milestones, some of the discussions that were really um, engage, uh, were engaged in, and many of you on this panel, some of you on this panel were engaged in some of these uh, uh, in-depth discussions. As one of the focus areas, I just want to, to, to bring up one, uh, one of the areas that is very, very close to the heart of quite a number of organizations spearheaded by our executive director, but also discussed at the recent uh, G7 meeting this is the Education Plus Initiative. This is a joint initiative of UNAIDS, UNESCO, UNF, uh, UNFPA, UNICEF, and UN Women to accelerate actions and investments to prevent HIV. It is centered on empowerment of adolescent girls and young women and the achievement of gender equality in Sub-Saharan Africa with secondary education as the strategic entry point. As you heard at the meetings when we were talking about a, a comprehensive sexual education, sexual reproductive health and rights, these were very difficult negotiations, but this we believe is a strong entry point to reach these girls. We believe Education Plus brings together governments, 
to demonstrate leadership, to make commitments to roll out secondary education that is free and calls on financial institutions and donor countries to support the leadership of African governments. It also brings together girls, movements, women's uh, movements, human rights movement, all those who care about the human rights of girls and the rights to equal opportunity. As you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is the epicenter of the AIDS epidemic. HIV continues to disproportionately impact girls on the continent. Today, five in six newly infected adolescents aged between 15 and 19 in this region are girls. Over 600 adolescent girls in Sub-Saharan Africa are newly infected every day. AIDS is still the second leading cause of death among young women aged 15 to 24 in the region. Yet most adolescent girls do not have comprehensive knowledge about how to prevent HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. A South African study has shown that prevalence among girls who had finished high school was about half that among girls who had not, 8.6% versus 16.9%. Research shows that also that, include, that including discussions about gender and power dynamics in comprehensive sexuality education makes it five times more effective in preventing sexually transmitted infections. Now, the COVID-19 crisis threatens to worsen these vulnerabilities. We all have to act. It is also important to note that in the context of the recent G7 uh, Foreign and Development Ministers meeting in London last month, it was decided that 15 billion in development finance will be invested over the next two years. And we really appreciate that and applaud this effort, especially if this focuses on countries where access to jobs, where building resilient businesses and responding to devastating economic impacts of COVID-19 is something that is yet to be tackled. I welcome the full commitment of the G7 leaders to promote and protect the sexual and reproductive health and rights of all individuals and recognize the essential and transformative role they play in gender equality and in women's and girls' empowerment. In the recent discussions for the high level meeting, I think G7 countries were really in, in, in instrumental in getting us where we were able to get. I also welcome their commitment to sign this new global targets to get 40 million more girls into school and 20 million more girls reading by the age of 10 in low and middle income countries. These are the true solutions that we believe will get us to ending AIDS by 2030. UNAIDS really stands ready to work with all of you. We know the role MPs play. We know the role UK has played over the years fighting HIV, in fighting HIV AIDS. And we really wish to encourage you to continue to galvanize and impact on, global, uh, on the global AIDS response by continuously supporting the efforts of organizations like UNAIDS, like StopAIDS, like UNFPA and all these other organizations that I've mentioned so that we can continue to galvanize and coordinate world efforts to be able to deal with this. I'm sure Global Fund is going to be talking about what is on the impact, what is uh, the, the, the the work that is being done out there in the field, we find that without the Global Fund, without partnerships like the, the Global Fund, like PEPFA, the work that uh, countries of the G7 contribute to, whether in resources, in sciences, has been able to bring us up to where we are. And we think if we work together and make sure they are adequate uh, domestic and uh, ODA resources for HIV through the 2030, we'll be able to sustain the gains we've made. And I really wish to thank you and hope that the members of parliament that are on this, the, the, the leaders in the communities, the civil society 
we will continue to work with One Voice to ensure that we can be able to get to the finished mile by removing all the, uh, the, 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 the roadblocks that are on our way. And I really want to thank you and uh, uh, emphasize the role that members of parliament will continue to play in deciding on some of these factors that, I will, that will get us to the finished mile. I thank you again. Well, thank you very much, um, Rosemary, and uh, for, for setting out the scene so capably. And uh, um, I actually, just before joining this call, I was on a, a virtual visit to a village in Togo, um, actually where there was an important um, education uh, uh, for women and girls program about HIV going on and also um, a testing opportunity and obviously um, uh, all of that was critically continuing to go on uh, whilst dealing with COVID, whilst dealing with the other maternal health challenges that there were in that community and so uh, it's very apt to hear what you've just been saying about the importance of, of those two things. Um, I want to come now to Peter. Uh, Peter, uh, familiar figure to all of us, um, over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephen, and thanks to the APPG for hosting this great event. It's, it's great to be speaking alongside um, such great partners and um, friends um, in the fight against HIV. Um, <clears throat> I think the timing of this UN high level meeting on HIV AIDS was brilliantly um, timed just before the G7, 40 years after the US CDC first identified a cluster of cases. 20 years after the creation of the Global Fund, which was G7 or at least then G8 initiated. And in the middle of the biggest pandemic since HIV struck humanity. So I think it was a really, really timely thing. And congratulations to UNAIDS in particular for um, getting it to happen and also to um, getting such a robust declaration out of it. The last 40 years, when we reflect on it, has been 40 years of tragedy. We've lost over 32 million people, a staggering total. It's been 40 years with some fantastic progress. Uh, since the Global Fund was created, deaths, annual deaths from HIV have fallen by 61% from the peak. But also 40 years, which isn't at the end of this story, um, 40 years where we still have years to go and we want it to be only nine more years to 2030, but we have quite a challenge to ensure we get where we want to by 2030. And I do think that getting to that robust declaration from the UN HLM was uh, not a trivial achievement and was by no means um, obvious at points in the negotiations that we would get to um, it. But I think we should acknowledge that an even bigger challenge will be translating those targets and those aspirations um, into reality. And I'd highlight um, three things. Um, one is that COVID-19 continues to disrupt HIV programs all over the world. And we are by far from through the COVID-19 pandemic. I know that in some countries in the world with high levels of vaccination and the attention is beginning to move on to talking about future pandemic preparedness and interest in COVID-19 itself is beginning to wane. But for most of the world, and certainly for those bits of the world which are most affected by HIV, we're still very much in the middle of this. And while we are in the middle of this, it will continue to have a significant knock-on impact on services for uh, HIV AIDS. And thus, the, both the COVID-19 response itself and the actions being taken to mitigate the impact on HIV AIDS are enormously important. And the, the Globe Fund, is, as you will know, is very, very active in this. On top of our underlying programming for HIV, TB, and malaria, we also have a mechanism called the COVID-19 response mechanism, or C19RM. And we are deploying about $3.7 billion um, through that to support countries 
both in their COVID-19 responses and in their actions to mitigate the impact on HIV, TB, and malaria. So weathering the current crisis and getting through it as quickly as possible is absolutely uh, essential. A second thing I think is critical if we are to translate the ambitions of the declaration into reality is to really step up our game on prevention activities. And prevention has been the underperforming bit of the fight against HIV even before COVID-19 struck. We were doing better on reducing mortality than we were on reducing new infections. But that gap has been widened by COVID-19 um, through really determined and creative and uh, passionate responses through the COVID-19 crisis. I think the worst case scenarios of what would happen if people's access to antiretrovirals were in large part avoided. There was, there was absolutely damage and disruption, but it wasn't nearly as bad as say the um, initial UNAIDS um, projections said might be the case. But the prevention side, we have to acknowledge, has been very badly disrupted. And indeed, you know, one indicator of that is we did a sample of 500 um, testing facility, 500 healthcare facilities across Africa and Asia, and testing levels had fallen by 40%. Um, and we've seen similar data sources on um, enrollment into antiretroviral treatment. So we are we are. We weren't where we wanted to be on prevention before the crisis. We are even further away from where we want to be. Um, now, to get that right, we have to step up and get better at a lot of the stuff that is in the declaration. It's around a rights-based approach. It's around tackling the human rights and gender-related barriers. It's about um, giving communities, empowering communities with the tools to actually address those barriers and provide the services that, that, that people need. And we're doing this against a backdrop, we need to do this against a backdrop in which we, many countries, the COVID crisis has seen us move the wrong way. COVID has exacerbated health inequalities in most countries. The COVID responses have, and this is a, a generalization, but what I would say is, in general, they've been very top down um, and have had mixed levels at best of engagement of communities. Um, and so the context in which we need to step up the empowerment of communities to protect themselves and the dismantling of barriers to access and the promulgation of a, a more effective rights base to health is one in which we've moved, spent the last 12 months sort of moving in the wrong direction. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that because we've got to be realistic about the nature of the challenge. And then the, the final challenge we need to um, uh, surmount of where to translate the ambitions of the declaration um, into reality is one of money. Um, uh, we can achieve a lot of things through better policies, innovation, being more efficient and effective, but we also need more money. Um, and um, we, we are going to have a tough challenge and we're going to have to be very uh, coordinated as advocates um, and parliamentarians are going to play a massive role um, in this. Um, because there are going to be so many competing pressures. We have donor countries saying their fiscal situation isn't as good because of the economic impact of the crisis. We have the countries in which HIV burdens are highest also suffering the impacts of the crisis. We have the competing demands of the COVID-19 response. We have an increasing emphasis on spending money on pandemic preparedness for future to protect against future pathogens. And we need to ensure that all of that isn't at the expense of the money that's required to fight HIV.
And in a sense, that I think requires us to really redouble on the messaging around HIV as an unfinished pandemic. We shouldn't allow people to be talking about pandemics and not talking about um, uh, uh, HIV, but also HIV as, in a sense, the, uh, the pioneer or the icebreaker on taking a truly inclusive, rights-based approach to providing healthcare. Um, and that we should use that as a model for the way we think about the COVID response, because otherwise the COVID response, I can guarantee you, will end up in a place where you have marginalized populations still suffering from COVID-19 long after it's fallen off the news bulletins in the rich countries um, in the world. So we, we, we must, in a sense, not, not compete with the, with the dialogue around COVID-19 and pandemic preparedness versus HIV, but make HIV and the fight against HIV part of the story of the how the world needs to take a better approach, a more inclusive and more rights-based approach to two pandemics of which HIV is the last big one we suffered before COVID-19. I'll stop there and back to you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Peter. And I was really struck by what you said about the um, the emerging evidence on the, the drop in testing facilities and access to ART and, and, and others, because obviously, as you say, we weren't in the right position before this and certainly to be going backwards is, is deeply, deeply concerning. Um, and I think that needs neatly your comments on, on, on the politics and the money leads neatly into uh, Ricardo, who it's been a pleasure to work with and colleagues on the call will also be aware of the uh, uh, lively discussions, let's put it that way, that we've been having in the UK Parliament um, involving a cross party um, sort of effort really criticising the current and UK government's decisions to uh, cut overseas development assistance, including funding to uh, many HIV and AIDS programmes, which is deeply of concern to all parties. Um, and we've had everybody from the Labour side through to the former Conservative Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May, criticising those decisions. And we will continue our fight, so you can be assured of that, uh, Peter and uh, uh, Rosemary. Uh, Ricardo, over to you. Well, thanks, Stephen, and uh, hello to everyone. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here, and congratulations for getting this APPG meeting uh, up and running uh, with such impressive speakers and for continuing to push forward as you've always done uh, over the years, uh, these important topics. I'd like to greet you and Andrew Uhm and two dear friends, members of the Unite Parliamentarians Network, but also of course, our my dear friends, Rosemary at UNAIDS and uh, Peter Sands at the, the Global Fund. Um, the truth is, uh, uh, Stephen, we are both in parliament uh, and we are actually both in the opposition and we know that that's not easy. Uh, but we also know it's a fight worth fighting. And, and thank you also for your leadership, not only as an MP, but also as shadow foreign uh, affairs and international development minister. Unite is truly lucky to, to have you on board. A warm greeting to, to Rosemary and uh, a great, it's great to, to be sharing this uh, stage with you. And I also uh, would ask you to congratulate Winnie uh, and all of the team for the organization of a particularly hardworking UN high level meeting. And of course, uh, special uh, greetings to Peter Sands at the Global Fund with whom uh, UNITE has a long standing commitment in working across uh, the three diseases. And uh, I'm glad that our teams continue to work closely together. 20 years ago, the United Nations General Assembly convened its first ever special session to address a pandemic that was causing death and devastation at a tremendous scale, overwhelming communities and health systems alike. The emergence of AIDS was an unprecedented global challenge and it was met with worldwide solidarity and action, very similar to the situation we are in a different context living today with COVID-19. As a physician by training, I, I saw how politicians over the years have many times muted um, the, the importance of uh, the issues and the rights of men who have sex with men and people who are using drugs uh, 
uh, over these last 40 years when the first cases of HIV were detected. It was a particular time in history. Uh, we were in the Cold War uh, we, in South Africa. Nelson Mandela was in prison for many more years. Uh, Lady Di and Prince Charles got married. Yet uh, an unknown virus was about to harden the lives of people in many already uh, broken places. Today, the world's largest economies are not just uh, in the West, but have grown in many parts of the globe. Science has gained more momentum and health is now front and center of global development. Never in history has the world moved so fast to develop a safe and effective vaccine that protect us from a potentially deadly virus. However, we have seen throughout the past month that not all international mechanisms are equally efficient Furthermore, there aren't enough international platforms or spaces to address health as a global community. In many places, too many places, the vulnerable continue to be vulnerable. Moreover, COVID-19 has placed enormous additional pressures on HIV responses, health systems, and people in need of services. Six years after the UN General Assembly set the ambitious goal to end AIDS by 2030, momentum is being lost. And we are focusing many, uh, many of us uh, in our discussions on the 390s and now the 395s, which are very much focused on our biomedical goals. But we also need to look at the fourth 95 of the quality of life, looking at the long-term range of people living with HIV as a chronic condition. And without momentum, all of these discussions will be lost over time. And so we need to make it clear, tackling pandemics means giving power to community-led organizations and services in hard to reach territories. It means ensuring strong healthcare systems that protect the most vulnerable, uh, people in most vulnerable situations with strong primary healthcare outcomes. And it also means treating people living with HIV and most importantly, ensuring stigma-free and human rights-based policies that deliver patient-centered services. The truth is we've been using uh, stigma-free and human rights-based policies as a jargon in key UN and G7 meetings. Uh, just recently, we have seen enormous pledges of vaccine sharing from G7 meetings. Last week, heads of states have set the goal of vaccinating at least 60% of the global population. They also pledged to share 870 million doses directly over the next year presumably meaning enough for 435 million fully immunized individuals with two doses per person. But 60% of the global populations comes to 4.7 billion people or roughly 10 times that number. However, when it comes to keep the ball rolling and to make sure words are turned into action, you truly need representative leadership. A table where parliamentarians are seated in uh, an interface with civil society, international organization, national governments, media, both conventional media and non-conventional media, and the private sector. We need to bring everyone around that same team. And that's where people like Stephen, like Andrew, as I try myself, we try to step in as policymakers, as those elected representatives of the people, the ones that actually can change laws, that can change budgets, that keep governments accountable, and influence policymaking. We are the ones that hold those national governments and international organizations accountable in the name of the people. To promote those strong policies, that safe environment, that enabling platform for healthier lives and well being for all, is also the best evidence to end a, that we can end the AIDS epidemic. As the O'Neill Institute recent uh, white paper mentions, law is one of several epidemiological, social, economic, and political factors driving differential success. We know that the legal environment can play a powerful role in the well being of the people living with HIV and those vulnerable to HIV. Law is particularly powerful when it comes to key populations experiencing higher HIV rates and lower access to services, including gay men and other men who have sex with men, sex workers, transgender people, people who inject drugs. It is critical that law in books become law 
in action. And as policymakers, we are obliged to make sure that both of those things happen. The same white paper that I mentioned before argues that countries who favor criminalization and harmful policies are making it harder for the economic, social, and economical, epidemiological success. The mistrust bias, harassment of these harmful policies are driving people living with HIV away from basic prevention and treatment services. They are undermining our global efforts to end AIDS as we had stated as a goal by 2030. I therefore would like to welcome on behalf of the Unite Global Parliamentarians Network to End Infectious Disease, we would like to welcome the new global AIDS strategy adopted for the next five years that includes a key indicator of success that focuses on removal of criminalizing laws alongside expansion of efforts to combat stigma, gender-based violence, and human rights violations. We have seen here in Portugal, just to mention drug policy, how ending criminalization over 20 years ago has been able, able to save thousands of lives in the two decades throughout which the policy has been implemented. That's why UNITE is ready to step in to not only follow the guidance from the current the, the new strategy, but to implement the removal of key policy barriers that prevent people from living in a safe environment. We need to act upon this new strategy. We need to deliver those policy recommendations. Parliamentarians can be at the front line of removing criminal laws. Lastly, uh, as uh, Winnie had said at the UNITE's Global Summit last year, MPs, members of parliament, senators, uh, representatives in Congress, we all have the power of the purse. The power is ours and it is to serve you and each of us, the people. We are the ones who can make sure that money is, challenged, is channeled into the right places. Next year is a replenishment for the Global Fund. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of supporting fully the organization that is leading the largest programs on health system strengthening. And I congratulate Stephen for his leadership in recent discussions around UK budget cuts, as well as Andrew's impressive track record in making Germany a global health leader. And I wish you the best also for the upcoming presidency of the G7. I'm sure we will work together along those lines. If I had to leave with one message today, is that 40 years is too long after too many G7 and high level meetings. The generations after mine will not wait for politicians and diplomats to come and solve climate change injustice. They will not wait for better education or better health services. Either we keep their pace or we uh, will lose our once in, an off, in a lifetime opportunity to be the leaders that the people deserve. We elected officials have the power to unite, to, present, to protect, to preserve, and to defend the rights of, of all people, but most particularly those in most vulnerable situations to make sure that everyone is entitled to living happy and healthy lives and livelihoods. It is time for us to end AIDS. It's time to end infectious diseases. It's time to unite. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo, and um, and absolutely endorse uh, all of what you've said, but also particularly that point about um, the legal frameworks and the criminalisation, particularly of marginalised communities. Something we've done um, significant work on um, in our in our group, and um, which unfortunately we've seen the cover of COVID used by some governments around the world, of course, to regress the rights and legal protections of many of those marginalised communities. Um, and I know that's going to be a great concern to all of us. And uh, conscious of time, we are we are moving on, and I want to do to get some uh, questions. From the floor in due course. I've already seen a few come in there. So if you do have a question for the panelists, uh, pop them in there and we'll try and come to those at around just after uh, four o'clock and get some of those um, put to the panelists. But I want to come on to um, civil society and community groups, obviously absolutely crucial in the fight against HIV AIDS and meeting that uh, 2030 target. And we've got Aaron, uh, Mike and uh, Pimeza. Um, and so I wanted to um, just give them a, a couple of minutes each just to make some brief uh, reflections on the key challenges they see. Um, and I'll come to um, Aaron first and then Mike and then um, Pumeza, um, I believe 
uh, to make some specific comments about uh, their experience um, of surviving multi-drug resistant TB and the importance of integrated care between um, those living with TB and HIV. So, um, yeah, um, yeah I, maybe I could just uh, make a few comments based on um, building on uh, the, the great comments from uh, Peter Rosemary and Ricardo. Um, uh, you know, it's really an honor to be part of this panel of leaders of the HIV response from the community uh, up to the global level. Um, I think we're all really worried that we might be facing a new AIDS emergency, uh, particularly in uh, following COVID and urgent action is really needed to get us back on track. Um, in terms of sort of the, the key barriers facing us uh, to reaching the 2030 target, uh, Peter, Rosemary and Ricardo really highlighted several of the key barriers remaining for us to reach that target. Um, before this uh, panel, I, I sat down and sort of thought, OK, what are the key barriers? And I came up with eight. Of course, there are many. Um, and um, I'm glad to say I, I really heard, you know, at least sort of uh, six of those being mentioned by colleagues previously. And so, uh, you know, they mentioned criminalization of key populations, prevention, gender inequality, sexual reproductive health and rights and comprehensive sex, sex education, meaningful integration of HIV into broader universal health coverage and the pandemic response, as Peter rightly highlighted, and of course, uh, the lack of global and national funding. Um, there are three barriers uh, I might also sort of, uh, uh, or two barriers I might also highlight. One, which I think we'll come on to talk about more, is the lack of funding for community response and community system strengthening. And there's, there's really good progress being made uh, in those areas, but still lots to do. And the, the last one um, re really is um, uh, around intellectual property and the R&D system, which really means that ARVs and indeed as we're seeing across COVID um, uh, and the you know, production of vaccines remain um, a, a massive problem in actually getting you know, enough medicines um, at a, um, a, a reasonable cost um, out to everyone who needs them. Um, and we're certainly seeing, you know, in, in, for HIV, uh, ARVs in middle income countries remain prohibitively expensive um, and not profitable areas like research into pediatric HIV treatments remain neglected. Um, I wanted to make um, just a, so those are the sort of remaining barriers. I wanted to make a, just a few comments in relation to, I think we saw all of those challenges emerging in the political declaration. And we, we really welcome the adoption of the political declaration and really want to, um, again, uh, commend uh, UNAIDS for their leadership in, in that area. It's important to remember, as Peter said, that it's not just a piece of paper. It will have real world consequences for millions of people living with HIV and affected by HIV. And it is an opportunity to get HIV back on track. Uh, it was you know, really alarming that uh, it, um, it went, had to go to a vote and that there were significant challenges in, in the negotiations. Um, there, were, there were lots of really positive things, and I think Rosemary hi highlighted those. I would say that there, there were also were some significant challenges where there was diluted language or removed text around critical areas in the declaration. Um, those are things around, you know, sexual reproductive health and rights, uh, comprehensive sexuality education, harm reduction, sexual orientation and gender identity decriminalization and repealing punitive laws. And of course, as I mentioned previously around the barriers, you know, trips waivers to make essential medical technologies and innovations more equitably available. Um, so, you know, I think we, you know, we know these are the real challenging areas and that's really, I think, where we uh, need to put uh, a lot of our focus. Um, I just wanted to make um, a couple of comments on the G7. Um, we believe the G7 summit was a huge missed opportunity for both the HIV response and COVID-19 um, and really not quite the sort of the vision and ambition displayed at this G7 um, as you know was displayed as Peter mentioned in the creation of the Global Fund and you know um, the UN um, declarations around HIV in 2005. Um, it did not include, the communique did not include specific references to HIV, um, and I, I really felt that actually the wealthiest countries um, showed a really narrow um, conceived self-interest uh, and really didn't step up to the plate. 
Um, it was good that the G7 did recognize the Global Fund and Unitaid's crucial role in delivering life-saving life medical and other supplies for the COVID-19 response. Um, but it really did fail to deliver for the COVID-19 response. And uh, I think former UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown described it as an unforgivable moral failure um, in breaking its vaccine promise to the world. Um, so I, you know, I think that just only highlights again the, the intellectual property issue that I um, highlighted earlier. I will just um, wrap up my comments um, by just mentioning a bit more about the UK cuts. Um, and Stephen has already mentioned those and been doing great work on that. And all of us uh, are around this table uh, and beyond have, have really been just trying to highlight just what um, uh, a staggeringly bad decision this was by the UK government uh, at a time uh, to cut from 0.7% of GNI to 0.5%, 4 billion. Uh, cuts slap bang in the middle of a global health crisis um, and it, it, it absolutely makes no sense um, at all. Um, it is very important and we do welcome the fact that the UK government is maintaining its existing commitment to the Global Fund um, uh, and has made a renewed commitment to the Robert Carr Foundation and was vocal in the high level meeting. But um, this doesn't uh, in any way make up for the huge catastrophic cuts that have been made with the 80% cuts to UNAIDS, 85% reduction to UNFPA, 92% uh, this year for UNITAID cut, um, and huge cuts across the civil society um, uh, across the board. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to sort of end by highlighting that last week, you know, I joined along with many others here, um, over 150 UK cross-party parliamentarians and leaders in the HIV response sending a letter to Boris Johnson to urging the government to repair those cuts, um, particularly on HIV and to give announced supplementary allocations to UNAIDS, UNFPA uh, um, and UNITAID um, to make sure that we don't lose that progress we've made, but also crucially to urgently return to 0.7% of, of, uh, of GNI um, next year in 2022. I'll end there and back to you, Stephen, thanks. Thank, thanks so much, Mike, and pretty pretty stark um, figures there. And thank you also for all the support that um, Stop AIDS always provides to us and the partnership that you provide and, and the voices that you bring um, to bear on policymakers is absolutely critical. And uh, we'll come to Andrew in a little bit uh, uh, to hear if we can hopefully expect some better from uh, Germany as uh, president of the G7. Um, so we'll, we'll come to him shortly. But before we do that, um, over to Aaron, who I hope has got my question on the uh, chat. Aaron. All right. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? All right, so thank you for the uh, opportunity to join everyone at this uh, time. And also congratulations to us for the success of the HLM, uh, which I'm proud to say because I'm also the multi-stakeholder uh, planning uh, tax force team. Uh, well, as you have placed it upon there regarding the role of civil society towards the ending, uh, towards uh, 2030, I can, I can assure you that uh, we didn't get where we get to today without the effort of the civil society and the communities. Um, we, we, we can say what our role uh, oftentimes uh, are looked from the lenses of just being the voice, but civil society have demonstrated over time that beyond just activism, beyond just advocacy, we also can be at the ground ground at the community level to ensure that those programs uh, are run in such a way that they meet uh, the, the, the target. So um, we are, in a, we are in, a, in a time whereby the world itself is affected by, by global crisis. None of us saw COVID-19 coming, but I can still assure you that during this uh, perilous time, the civil society also stood their ground to ensure that we didn't lose the gains we have made over time on HIV, TB, and malaria, especially uh, with the support from Global Fund, uh, UNAID, and other multilateral and also uh, donors. Uh, so, um, as as a, as a community, as a community, we have continued to ensure from our own end we hold government accountable. But oftentimes, one of the things this, I, I think from now, I just have to rush through because of time and then uh, engage with some of the challenges that I keep on foreseeing, especially from us as young people, 
uh, because also I'm looking at it from the lens of adolescents and young people. I miss the fact that we have uh, uh, a role to continue playing. We continue to realize that the civil society space is, conti is continually shrink, is continu continually shrink. And also, even within the, 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 the global fund uh, mechanism at country levels and all that, you can continue, you can practically keep seeing that the civil society are often uh, times left behind in some of the critical decision making level, especially adolescents and young people. How many CCM can I say we have the representation of the youth there? So um, again, these are very these are these are pressing issues that I believe that um, if we are not on the seats to to contribute and also to add our voices continuously, we will definitely not get to anywhere. Again, policies policies have continued to affect affect communities from uh, making maximum impact in the programs they run. Age of consent have continued to be there. Punitive laws have been there. Human rights and the rest. So uh, all these things continue and. Again, uh, you know, civil society are more like a dependent uh, nature. We, we, we rely on the resources we have to be able to do what we have to do. So funding has always been an issue. Funding has always continued to, to be an issue. Beside that, institutional capacity, not all civil society has strengthened to ensure that programs are done at, at, at scale and also at the way it should be done. So institutional strengthening at, at, at also continue uh, to be uh, a major issue. So um, this among many, this among many, because if I keep on listening, listen them, we will just, we will just spend a whole while speaking here. So, but one of the things I really want to uh, call on both the UK parliamentarian, the Global Fund, and as well as UNAIDS, we need to sustain the effort we have started. Uh, I really ap applaud the fact that when uh, COVID-19 started, the COVID response mechanism was done such a way that the CSOs were not, uh, communities were left out at the first phase. But with strong ad ad advocacy, we can see that this second phase, communities are meaningfully engaged in the COVID response mechanism. So um, UNH have also been backbone, UK have also been a backbone supporting at, at, at own capacity. So we, we just need to continue to sustain that support for civil society because I believe it is supposed to be patient-centered, nothing without us, without, uh, without us. The decision should not be made without us. The resources should not be allocated without us. And again, if I'm speaking from the perspective of my colleague at the Multi-Stakeholders Forum, we have said 80% of our intervention or services should look into key and vulnerable populations and civil society and 6% of funding should also be prioritized for civil society to see how we'll be able to uh, continually sustain our effort. Thank you very much. Aaron, thank you so much and absolutely uh, concur with what you said about um, uh, the involvement of civil society and, and the community at every stage, um, people living with HIV um, in, in making these decisions and, and how we go forward. Um, uh, I want to come to uh, Pumeza. Pumeza. Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. Okay, so I am Pumeza Chisile. I am from Cape Town, South Africa. I am a TV advocate at TV Proof, who I use my voice uh, and to advocate at high-level meetings for quality person for quality person-centered TV care for all, free from stigma and discrimination. So, uh, well, the toxin medication that was supposed to cure my XTR, I was only had XTR and not MGR, made things worse. I woke up one morning and suddenly I could not hear anything. I was deaf in both ears overnight. Now imagine being told that you are deaf and that it is not reversible and that they were very sorry and that there's nothing that they can do. The problem started with my delayed diagnosis of two months. The initial first began testing did not show any signs of TB, causing confusion as to what was wrong with me. I did not have the obvious TB symptoms that I was asked about by the nursing staff because I was not coughing nor was I sweating at night. The doctor then suggested that I do a chest x-ray and then from the x-ray they were sure that I had TB. So I started on what I call normal TB medication with three tablets that were easy to take, but I was not getting better, I was getting worse. I had to test again, and then this time the results showed that I actually MGR TB. 
Then after that, it was a series of devastating events. The injection, as I said, caused my hearing loss. I was then told I'd pre xr TV, but then they saw something unusual in my lungs, liquid that needed to be drained. They drained it, but in the process, they broke my ribs and punctured my lungs, meaning I had to stay longer at the hospital. Two years later, I was informed that I'd xr TV and that my chances of surviving were like 20%. At some point, I was advised to see a priest to, like, to prepare myself because they, they were sure that it was highly likely that I would die, but then I survived. So as I said, I work for TB Proof. So TB Proof co-launched a campaign for an all oral GRTB treatment regimen based on our scientific evidence combined with our TB, like TB survivor stories to, to effect policy change. For instance, South Africa and the WHO updated their guidelines to prioritize the use of the new uh, TB medication called the Feracolin and the Linozid to replace the injectable drugs. So the PRTB needs high quality medication that is less toxic and it sure needs a vaccine to prevent the true devastation that is caused by the terrible disease. I would not wish what I went through on anyone. It was hell and the worst part is that TB is preventable and curable. Yet the drugs are old and toxic and the TB vaccine is 100 years old and it is useless to adults. So as a TB advocate, I advocated for also South African government to fix the patent laws so that everyone could have uh, access to life-saving drugs. And then now we are fighting, for instance, for the COVID vaccine. So lastly, um, there is a need, there is a need for agent, there is an agent need to implement the recovery plan to reduce the impact of COVID-19 on TB and HIV care. Stigma reduction campaigns are needed to reduce TB, COVID-19 and HIV stigma. We are at an unusual moment where TB and HIV community can reach key and vulnerable groups by leveraging COVID-19 to increase awareness, of awareness about TB symptoms, transmission, infection, and prevention. We cannot fight one disease without the other. I mean, we know TB and HIV, they always go together, and then we need to do more. So yes, that, that's, my, that's my point. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you and for speaking so powerfully about your own um, experiences um, and the difficulties you've experienced. And I think it also highlights just just how much the the, the fight that we're all in is not, is not just one on on HIV. It's not just one on TB. It's for it's for global health and for integrated services that work at the right time for people and um, before uh, there are terrible implications. So um, thank you for speaking so passionately. Um, uh, last but not least, I just want to come to Andrew, who's been patiently waiting, um, our colleague from Germany, um, having heard. Uh, uh, from our previous panelists, Andrew, about the barriers in reaching the 2030 target, the role of civil society, the importance of funding, the importance of legal change, and of course, the, the real lived experiences are, are, of people living with HIV. Um, what, uh, what, what do you think are the, are the key uh, issues going forward? And uh, what hope can we have from a German uh, presidency of the G7? Andrew. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. It's a great pleasure being here with you all. I would more love to see you in 3D instead of 2D. Uh, that would be a lot better. Uh, however, uh, as you and uh, Ricardo, I'm also an opposition politician. Uh, so we're working on a change, a significant change in September where we have new elections coming up. Uh, the polls are looking good, at least for my party and for myself. Uh, so I could maybe give you more information what could happen with the G7 starting uh, next year with Germany as the presidency, because as you all know, uh, presidency is always connected with the chancellery. And uh, one thing is for sure, Angela Merkel is not going to be the next uh, chancellor because it's very clear that she is quitting. And uh, so we'll see how things will change. But uh, I'm very optimistic that uh, with multi-partisanship in the German parliament, we are very interested in shaping global health in a better way because the latest after the COVID-19 pandemic, we are all aware how important healthcare and global health especially is because many of my parliamentarian colleagues weren't so much aware what really global health means. And uh, not everybody really knows what SDG means and how important primary health care in this situation is. And that is the situation going to AIDS. And actually, I was shocked because I didn't really look at the timetable when uh, 40 years ago, um, HIV was first described. And I was a young med student back then. And uh, I remember uh, back 
uh, in those 80s where I was first taught that the chapter on infectious diseases is closed. And uh, all of a sudden we had to learn all kinds of new diseases and opportunistic infections. And uh, the problems around AIDS that it's uh, not only a, an infectious disease, but also uh, a, society, a challenge to society, being aware with men having sex with men, uh, drug abuse, um, and uh, blood transfusion issues, many uh, issues around HIV and AIDS, and that it had became a global pandemic. Uh, and since then we made huge progresses. But on the other hand, I remember graduating from medical school because I'm also a physician by training uh, that we all thought in 10 years from now, and that would be over 30 years from today back, and that AIDS and HIV will be a part of the history books and uh, we would find a pill and everything be, is, is cleared. And we are more than aware as physicians, but also especially as politicians, and um, that infectious disease is a big challenge. And that's, I'm, I'm so glad that I met Ricardo, uh, I think three years back, Ricardo, if that's, uh, if that's the case, I remember correctly, almost four years back, uh, that UNITE is a group of parliamentarians who want to end infectious disease. Uh, and that could only be possible in a united world. And uh, it was very disappointing to see how the world was divided and still is divided in the COVID-19 pandemic situation that we're still facing because the pandemic threat isn't over yet, despite the facts of good progress that we're facing in Europe and uh, the vaccine campaigns that we have in our states, but we still have to be aware that many countries do not even have 1% of their population vaccinated yet. And uh, many of these threats that we're facing is going to destroy, I'm using on purpose this very strong word, it's gonna destroy all the efforts the past years on fighting the HIV pandemics and uh, especially um, the, the public health efforts that were made internationally. I actually do uh, appreciate very much the declaration on HIV and AIDS, but I also share a concern, what Peter just said, I think Peter was the one who said that, that we have to be sure that this is not only a nice paper to read and to uh, reflect on, I would expect to see more legislation happening. And I think this is what we have to do as parliamentarians because we have a critical role to play to end the fight in, of AIDS, which is very desperately needed. And that is why the network such as UNITE is so important to align forces in order to take action and work together to overcome the barriers that are impending in the implementation of a comprehensive HIV response. But we also have other high level political forums that offer um, an increased, let's put it very bluntly, financial investments into work for, for U, UNAIDS, WHO Global Fund. And these are um, the European Union, the G7, the, the G20, the European Parliament, the British Parliament uh, as well. I, I still have some hope that one day uh, the UK will, will return to the European Union, but you never know. And so these are very important efforts and um, the G7 countries, or maybe one of these days at G8 again, whoever knows, can not longer ignore the growing H AIDS emergency uh, that we need to actually invest more into HIV and infectious disease and primary care as a vital part of the preparing the future of the pandemic. As we all know, Germany will be, be the upcoming G7 presidency in the year 2022 and will play, hopefully, and I'm very optimistic it will do, play a key role in leading this cause. Uh, and Germany has to expand its role in the global health. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that it will do so. We just had our last session uh, last week in parliament in the uh, subcommittee on global health. And we really recommitted ourselves in the different parties to expand the role of Germany in global health. So this is, as I said before, uh, very, a good basis for the upcoming elections that uh, in that point, we will not have big fights. We will be all unite. 
And um, I do hope that uh, all the critics that we just heard about the UK uh, aid cut could be overcome. And I hope that the negotiations between uh, the UK and uh, European colleagues would further strengthen uh, our alliances because uh, we need the international partnership to fulfill this declaration. And we have to make sure that the 2030 agenda is fulfilled, in particular, the implementation of the health related sustainable development goals. And it is important. Health is a human right, and namely, and we have to ensure the health life for everyone through a life cycle. And there's always more to be done. And I'm very optimistic that together as an international community of parliamentarians uh, united, we could do this. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. And ending on a, a positive note there is a, is a good thing when we've heard about all of the uh, the challenges. Um, I want to come to some of the questions that um, I've had now from uh, members of the audience. And um, obviously, we won't have time for every uh, panelist to respond to all of them. So I'll try and uh, try and put them to people or uh, the first come, first serve to jump in. Um, but and the first question is actually a specific question to Peter, um, which is from um, Jorge Saavedra, um, which is essentially around those global structures. Um, and he says, essentially, the Global Fund was created to fight um, three pandemics, AIDS, TB and malaria. Um, but we need something now to respond to other pandemics. Why create a new uh, separate global fund when we've got the current global fund as a successful model? Um, I just wondered what what Peter's view was on the kind of global health architecture going forward. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks, Jorge, for the uh, question. Um, look, it's obviously the case that the Global Fund can have a role to play, both in pandemic preparedness and response. Um, the responses of many of the countries in which the Global Funds invest to COVID have been based on the infrastructure that was put in place to fight HIV, TB, and malaria. It's not like what you do to fight an existing pathogen is massively different from what you do to prepare to fight a, a pathogen that might be uh, emerging. Um, I think, so fundamentally, I agree with you, we don't need uh, a new institution. And, and I would also say more generally than just the Global Fund, um, the global health space has quite a lot of institutions, many of which are underfunded relative to their mandates. Um, so to add yet another one would probably not be um, the most helpful um, thing. I think the thing, though, that is challenging is that if the Global Fund is going to um, expand its mandates in any way, um, we cannot do so um, with the same amount of funding, because the consequence of that would be to dilute our ability to support the fight against HIV, TB, and uh, malaria. And, and so um, and that is one of the issues the board at the moment in our strategy discussions is kind of wrestling with. Um, I think the board is acutely conscious of the value that the Global Fund can bring to making people, and particularly the poorest and most vulnerable and marginalized communities, safer from the threat of new infectious diseases. But on the other hand, the board is rightly worried that we will be asked to do more without a um, uh, uh, commensurate increase um, in, in resourcing. Um, and so that, that's, that, that is the challenge. Um, I think it's good that the global uh, uh, leaders, G7, G20, are sort of debating and thinking through um, uh, these issues. I think the fundamental point I would make, and I think I'm totally aligned with you here, Jorge, is that the answers have to be built off the base of the institutions we've got, and they've got to be built off the base of the commitments we've made to communities and people about fighting the diseases that are killing them now. Diverting resources from diseases that are killing people now to diseases that might kill them is, is, is not an answer. Thank you, uh, Peter. Um, we've got a question now from um, Susan, um, uh, who asks, how can we ensure ideology doesn't eclipse science in tackling the HIV epidemic effectively in an increasingly fragmented world? And I think this is a really important question because obviously we've seen 
um, you know, misinformation and disinformation around HIV since the early days of the pandemic. And of course, we've seen that replicated in the response to COVID and, and indeed others. So um, I thought maybe I'd, I'd come to um, Ricardo and Rosemary on this. Ricardo, not least given his uh, medical background, but uh, Ricardo, are you there? Yes, um, Stephen, I, I think it's a extremely important question, um, especially now that uh, it's not just about ideology, it's about all of the somewhat biased news, sometimes even fake news that is floating around and sometimes being used to sustain certain ideological stances. And uh, at the end of the day, we are letting these non-scientific approaches undermine our efforts to do what is needed and what is right to respond in these different fronts. And, and so I think that um, it is our responsibility as, um, as policymakers to make sure that uh, science plays a very important role and finding new ways to put science at the service of policymaking and of the people. Uh, of course, not every MP is a doctor or a scientist, nor should they be. But there are ways to make sure that we uh, use data in a way that is perceivable to anyone of uh, what is the current situation, what is the reality. Um, in my work in academia, we've actually been using gamification of policymaking in which people can, in certain fields, uh, use apps to see what are the different outcomes of applying different policies based on scientific models so that everyone, each citizen in a very easy way on their phone, they can try out different policy options and see the impact of those policies in five or 10 years time in the specific area we are discussing. I'm using this example to say that we as policymakers, we need to find these new solutions, these new tools that actually um, are aligned with uh, people's concerns and the way people consume information, the way people uh, digest information and make sure that they are part of this process of decision-making. And if we put science as a pillar within that discussion-making process, we will be making sure that uh, any ideological stances, which ideology is important, but it cannot overcome the most important issues that are the ones that are based on data, based on real world data, based on science, that should be driving us and should be actually being used to help us create the bridges to overcome the, the ideological divides and helping us go across the aisle to find partners in uh, developing the, the laws and policies that we need to respond. Thanks, Ricardo. And I, I wondered if um, I could sort of put the same to, to Rosemary, but also if she might want to comment on one of the other sets of questions we've had, which is about that issue of criminalisation. And I know, Rosemary, you've put some pretty stark statistics on uh, the criminalisation and legal frameworks globally. And we've got questions from uh, Roger in Uganda and Julian on that about how we can further make progress um, and how we can further map and understand uh, what uh, challenges there are on criminalisation. Rosemary. Thank you very much. Um, just three points on, on, on that, on how we can ensure that science is not really drowned. One is to keep the issue of HIV and AIDS on the global agenda. And when I say this, I mean keep it there and genuinely so. In the recent uh, discussions and, 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 uh, and, and negotiations of the, in the high level meeting in New York, we, know, we observed how some countries would push some of these barriers that we are talking about down. Uh, and, I, and Mike uh, enumerated these. Uh, they, 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 and, and, and yet with the same, uh, and there would be another group that is also pushing trips down. So the negotiations would end up being uh, weakened or the key areas that we wanted to strengthen would be weakened because it becomes a fighting ground. Some people want to fight HA, want to fight uh, the rights. Others want to ensure that trips and the capacity to produce medication is not democratized and so on. So I, that's why I'm saying that let's keep these issues on the agenda. And then as we keep them on the agenda, keep the data and evidence coming. 
And I think Ricardo highlighted some of that. Uh, one of the key aspects of what will make us or break us with this inequality framing is going to be the data, the accuracy of the data that is brought out. Because I think some countries will find it difficult to drown the data if the data is right in front of them and is being used by policymakers, is being used by pressure groups, is being used by their civil society who are their voting people and so on. So I think keeping the evidence out there is going to be very helpful and strongly shine a strong light on this data. The third area I think that is going to be helpful is to find those voices that cannot be silenced. We were earlier talking about stop aids, what they've been doing. If we can have their backs, those that uh, the policymakers can have their backs, I think this can really push uh, the, 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 together with the with the with a strong with strongly shining a, a light on the on the data and the scientific evidence. I think this will going is going to really help us. So on the issue of criminalization, I think it's work, work, work. It's the legal frameworks that were talked about earlier. It's uh, enabling those who have no voice uh, and providing them the legal support that they need in making sure that we don't do the comfortable. You will recall that at the beginning of the COVID um, pandemic, UNAIDS uh, came out with uh, a report on human rights for 17 countries that were really using human rights uh, abuses to clamp down on the different groups of people, on getting rid of who they did not want, on making sure that everybody stayed in their place, uh, both politically and uh, ideologically, but using the COVID uh, pandemic. But that report uh, gave UNA such sleepless nights. So it's to make sure that these voices that can really come out it can keep coming out. I think there's a lot that needs to be done. And this can only be done with the support of uh, the, the decision makers, the policy makers, but it, it bringing out really and shining out a light on these atrocities, on these inequalities, on these barriers that unless we really are able to tackle the criminalization of the different groups of people, of the key populations, uh, the, 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 the inequalities in the economic means of those who can be able to afford or access treatment and so on. So it's important that these barriers, but especially the barriers that are based on human rights. I think when you look at it overall, even those who would be accessing both prevention, treatment, support, most of them are not getting what they should be getting because of these uh, the, 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 the rights-based issues. So just uh, to stop there, but I think uh, policymakers still retain a huge, huge uh, hand in this because everybody is looking up to them. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Rosemary. And I just wondered um, if Aaron or Pumeza had any comments on either of those issues, wanted to come in? Jump in if you do. Um, for me, it's just some sort of a closing comment, of which I, I think it's a quote, I think from Nelson Mandela. He said something like, we cannot win the battle against HIV if we do not also fight for TB. TB is too often a death sentence to people living with HIV. It does not have to be this way. We need to do more. Thank you, Pameza. Um And Aaron, are you still there with us? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So should I give you my last word? <laughs> yeah, if you if you would like to, I mean, I just wondered if you had any comment on um, uh, anything that had been said, or if you want to give us your last uh, thing, uh, like Pumeza, that you wanted to take away from this session today. Oh, we may have lost you again. We will come. We will come back, Aaron. 
Um, I, I wanted to give all of the panellists, just because we're into the last um, few minutes here, I wanted to give all of the panellists a chance to just give one one sentence, um, the last takeaway that they want to uh, give to all of the um, attendees today. We've had people from all over the world joining us, which is fantastic. Um, so I will try and get through everybody, but um, uh, perhaps we'll go to Mike Podmore first, and then I'll go through all the other panellists. Mike, one sentence. Always a challenge. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, the, the the political declaration really gives us a roadmap for the HIV response to get HIV back on track. And now we've just got to get the political will and the funding to make it a reality. And I think that that means, you know, obviously in the UK, uh, returning to 0.7 and recommitting uh, to great UK leadership on the HIV response. But it also means really th rethinking in the light of COVID, uh, rethinking uh, all of our different structures so that we can actually re get rid of these barriers that we've all been talking about, um, uh, both in terms of power, inclusion, uh, and crucially funding so that we can end the HIV um, uh, pandemic for once, once and for all. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Mike, and thanks, Pumesa. Uh, we will go to uh, Andrew next. Andrew, one last <laughs> takeaway for the audience. Okay. Uh, I was just thinking there's so, so many takeaways that I could uh, now say to you, but, but I think uh, it's, it's very obvious that uh, all stakeholders, people, polit political leaders, the scientific community, and also the other sectors beyond health have to work in partnership and align themselves to deliver the promise of uh, this declaration of AIDS. And also the I like always to stress the issues about the SDGs uh, to bring the 2030 agenda forward uh, at, for the health and well-being of all. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we will go to um, Peter next. And also, Peter, there was a question from Anne um, also about the role of corporates in this fight. We've talked a lot about governments today. I didn't know if you had any brief thoughts on that. Sorry, I was just trying to find Anne's question in the... Uh chat maybe i've missed it um yeah we just essentially did um uh, you know given that we talked a lot about governments what what role um of corporates got to um to step up on this and i think it's in the q a actually i've had it directly um uh, and they've got um uh, to be mobilized in this fight as well yeah let me address that one first um i think the private sector um has a massive role to play, both in terms of financial resources, but also in voice, in advocacy, um, but also in bringing the undoubted capabilities that many private sector institutions have, whether it's in technology or behavioral change or all sorts of different types of um, uh, uh, expertise and capacities um, to the fight against HIV and to infectious diseases um, more broadly. Um, my overarching um, message is um is is about the fact that the world has got into a habit and it's a very costly habit in terms of lives of allowing pandemics to become long tail epidemics and that's not a scientifically necessary thing it's in a sense a political choice um and a lack of political will um to finish the job. TB is one example. HIV is the example we're focused um, on, on today. And I am deeply worried that we will end up making COVID-19 yet another example uh, of the same phenomenon. And I actually think we should take the COVID-19 crisis as a catalyst to say, that actually, that's not the way the world should do this. There is, it's immoral. It's also just economically and epidemiologically irrational. It's not the, it's not the most effective way of dealing um, with these threats. Um, and what you end up with is different communities competing with each other to try and scrabble over available funds. Um, and I think we need, to, we need the world to take a bolder approach towards infectious disease threats and say, actually, no one in the world needs to be vulnerable to these diseases or indeed needs to be as unprotected to future threats. We, we actually have the capabilities and resources as the world um, to deal with that. But that means lifting the discussion 
a level beyond and to sort of Mike Pobler's point where the G7 was um, uh, uh, last week. That's a that's that's lifting it more in the kind of frame of the way people are thinking about the challenges of climate change. Um, but I think it is the right way we should be doing that because it's only if we take that kind of ambition will we really deliver on ending AIDS, ending TB, ending COVID-19 for everybody. Thank you, uh, Peter. And if Aaron's still with us, we'll, get, we'll try Aaron one more time just for his last word. I don't think he is. I think he's been cut off. Um, so we'll go to Rosemary last. Um, Rosemary, um, uh, you have the last word. I think I've gone through everybody and uh, then I'll just say a few thank yous. Rosemary. No, have we lost Rosemary as well? Rosemary, you're on mute. For some reason, I couldn't unmute, I'm sorry. That's all right, don't worry. Yeah, my last word is, let's not allow this issue to slip away from us. Let's keep shining a strong, strong light on these inequalities. I think once these inequalities are highlighted, then we can be able to keep everybody focused on this. And I think uh, this group that is here, the actors that are here, have capacity to keep pushing this issue so that it just doesn't disappear. That's fantastic. And last but not least, uh, Ricardo, my fellow uh, parliamentarian, uh, Ricardo. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, I'd just like to say very quickly that I, from a political perspective, um, the truth is COVID-19 has become a political black hole, sucking in all of the resources, interest, uh, attention span from policymakers, governments, everyone around the world. And as policymakers ourselves, we have the responsibility to gain back control. Uh, we need to challenge the force of gravity into making sure that we do not lose focus on the other issues that are equally important and that are suffering, suffering even more in this time of a pandemic, uh, especially those that live in most vulnerable uh, situations. And moreover, we know today that health, uh, even for those who didn't believe it before, health is now perceived as a clear, a clear prerequisite for global development, sustainable development, and um, well-being. And so we need to, for, in the future, starting now, to make sure that everyone in every realm of policymaking understands that health needs to be a top priority and have, we need to have health in every area of policymaking and every area of government. So uh, uh, making it short, uh, we need to go from defense to offense to make sure that we are taking the lead to make sure that we are putting the agenda where it needs to be front and center, regaining that momentum, putting the funds where they are needed, making the policy changes that are needed and making sure, especially in the most uh, vulnerable places around the world that our actions have true impact for the people. Thank you, Ricardo. Great note to end on. And I just want to thank all the participants today. I think one of the, there's been very few upsides to the COVID pandemic, but one of the upsides I think has been us all learning to use uh, these ways of communicating and as a result, be able to get together some fantastic collaborations um, across countries, across time zones, uh, across political parties, across perspectives. And um, that is crucial, as we've all said, in the fight against HIV and AIDS. And if we're going to meet that 2030 targets, particularly in these very difficult circumstances. So um, you certainly have the commitment of our group, the all party group to continue to work on that basis and not just to work in the UK on that basis, but to work with our partners across um, the globe. So particularly, I want to thank um, UNAIDS, um, the Global Fund and the Unite Network um, for partnering today um, and Stop AIDS too. And also to all of our participants, Rosemary, to Peter, Ricardo, Mike, Andrew, uh, Pumeza and Aaron, and all of you who've joined um, from around the world for your questions and for your support and solidarity. And, um, you know, I'd encourage you to look up the work of the organisations that um, have taken part today 
um, to parliamentarians, please join the United Network if you're not already members. And uh, we hope to be hosting you for another event soon. And I hope that uh, Andrew might take on uh, the opportunity of uh, hosting us virtually, but hopefully even better in person in Germany uh, in a few months time. But uh, thank you one and all. Uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, really appreciate your contributions.